there's a lot of hype around MTHFR, a lot of people talking about it, a lot of people making a very, very, very big deal about MTHFR. And you see people sort of being diagnosed with having certain MTHFR variants. And then you sit, sometimes see people sort of walking around, you know, convinced they've got some terrible genetic disease if they have certain MTHFR variants. Uh, I know that you did an article or a podcast recently or, or both with a mutual friend of ours, Alex Leaf, where you talked about some new research around MTHFR variants and certain specific B vitamins. Uh, that's not the typical thinking around the subject. So can you talk about that research and what the, this, this new study showed? Yeah, um, real quick before I do that, uh, no one gets diagnosed with MTHFR, diagnosis is a terrible word to use for that because it's not a disease. Right, um, now there is a, for everybody not watching the video, that's why I used air quotes. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, 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 right. Well, I wanna, I wanna just interject to support yeah. your air quotes, yeah. <laughs> um, although there is an exceedingly rare genetic defect that, that is a disease, but that's not what anyone is talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah, what Alex and I covered that I think is, you know, we didn't come up with it, but it's very underappreciated. Um, that we kind of un uncovered when we were extensively investigating riboflavin is that these MTHFR polymorphisms, which are variations in a gene, um, well, first of all, going back to the diagnosis thing, these things are so common, only about 10 or 15% of people don't have at least one of them. Mm. And, and so what you actually see is just six combinations that cause an even spread in MTHFR acti activity across the population. So just some people are at 100%, some people are at 25%, some people are at 45%, some people are at 65%. Um, I think that's an important thing to understand because a, a lot of the people who are sort of finding this information out of, uh, about themselves when they do this genetic analysis then no idea. Sort of are convinced that they're the 2% of the population that has this screwed up MTHFR variant and they don't realize that they actually, this is the majority of the population that has at least something going on. The, the reason that none, of their, that none of the people at church, school, and work have MTHFR is because none of them went to that functional doctor that you got and had their genes analyzed. <laughs> That's the only reason you stick out like a sore thumb. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, interestingly, I don't have any, any of the polymorphisms in my MTHFR, but, uh, I I'm, in, but I'm in the like, very minority on that. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so what Alex and I uncovered is that uh, it appears what these variations are doing is decreasing the enzyme's binding ability to bind to riboflavin, which is a vitamin B2, and which is an essential cofactor um, for MTHFR. So everyone thinks of MTHFR as involved in folate metabolism, and that's because it, it is, that's what it does, is it, it converts one form of folate to another in order to support the methylation process. But it can't do that without riboflavin. And so if the enzyme has a lower binding uh, affinity for riboflavin, which means it doesn't bind to it as tightly, then um, you're more likely to have more MTHFR that's not bound to riboflavin and is not functional at a normal sort of baseline of riboflavin. But like, let's say the person who has um, no, for, for people who are watching the video, I'm just setting my hands at different levels. Um, imagine the person who doesn't have uh, MTHFR polymorphisms is, um, is uh, their riboflavin requirement is here, and the average person has a riboflavin requirement here, just slightly above that. Well, if the, um, if the riboflavin need comes up to here, which for people just listening to audio is just slightly higher riboflavin requirement that just happens to be above what everyone is eating, then all of a sudden, those people are not meeting their riboflavin requirement for MTHFR. So what you see when you look at the activity is their MTHFR activity is low. But if you just raise the riboflavin level up to meet the need, then you don't see that the activity is lower. And so um, there are some pretty good studies on this. Both there's studies on the mechanistic front, then you know showing that the, the binding affinity is different, and that that you just need more riboflavin to saturate. Um, the, the ability of it to bind riboflavin. Then there's also human studies showing that in people with these polymorphisms specifically, a small amount of riboflavin will lower homocysteine into the normal range. And that, in fact, when you lower homocysteine 
in people with MTHFR, um, like almost all of the homocysteine lowering is isolated to the people who had poor riboflavin status. And if you take the general population and you supplement and you uh, and you look at who has elevated homocysteine, it basically falls into people who have MTHFR and poor riboflavin status. Mm -hmm. um, so it all lines up very well supporting this idea that it may be the case, or it's, it's definitely the case that some of the lower activity is a result of poor riboflavin status and you can fix it by just getting enough riboflavin. And it might be the case that all of the lo loss of activity is only a matter of poor riboflavin status. And if you just get enough riboflavin, you can bring that activity up to normal. Now, it doesn't mean that methylation is only about riboflavin because just having normal MTHFR activity does not, um, does not excuse you from needing nutritional support from your methyl for your methylation. Um, but it, it may well be the case that the first and foremost thing we should be thinking about with MTHFR is getting enough riboflavin. Okay, excellent. Hey there, this is Ari again. One more quick thing before you go. Just make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Energy Blueprint, and also make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or anything else. I hope you guys enjoyed this interview, and I will see you again next week.